Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I am Mackenzie Dean with Becker's Hospital Review. We will begin today's webinar with the presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. We are looking forward to hearing your questions. Additionally, in about a week following the webinar, we will be sending you a copy of the presentation to the email you used to register. At this time, it is now my pleasure to start today's webinar by introducing our presenters. Alpha Patel is a certified microbiologist and specializes in consults with clients about cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization of reusable medical devices, endoscopes, and tissue disinfection or validation processes. She actively speaks on cleaning, disinfection, sterilization, and tissue process validation. As a member and collaborator with the American Standard Test Methods, American Association of Tissue Banks, and American Association of Medical Instrumentation, she plays an active role in concert with the FDA and regulatory committees in developing standards and discussing and voting on changes to those standards. Alpha is one of a select group of experts in the industry, and her participation on these committees offers insight on industry trends and helps prepare Nelson Laboratories and its clients for the most up-to-date medical device validation requirements. Kamudi Kulkarni is the business development of microbiologist and manager of the research and development lab at Healthmark Industries. She has her MS degree from the University of Georgia in microbial, cellular, and molecular biology and a master's degree from India in microbial genetics. She is a voting member of at AAMI and ASTM, and is also involved in the worldwide ISO round robin protocols that impact cleaning of medical devices. Kamudi works with sterile processing professionals, medical device manufacturers, along with FDA and other professional groups and organizations. She is also actively involved in developing products that help improve patient care outcomes. Alpha, I'll now turn the floor over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this webinar that we will be presenting today. We will be talking about endoscope microbial surveillance testing made easy. There is a lot of uncertainty out there regarding this topic, and hopefully after listening to this webinar, we have helped clear up some concerns or questions you may have had regarding endoscope surveillance. These are um, me and Kamudi, just in case you guys wanted to see what we look like. <laughs> um, just wanted to put up a disclosure statement regarding the endoscope surveillance that the content presented in the presentation today is the opinion of the presenter, and this should be not used as a training guide or promotion. Healthmark and Nelson Labs policy is to provide our customers and healthcare community with the highest quality of service and support that helps our customers. The presentation that will be presented today is part of that commitment and service to educate our customers. Um, go ahead, Becky for the poll question. Thank you. Um, first poll question um, will be launched on your screen. Um, we are asking who is attending today. Um, if you could please select one of the five options, um, we will be able to kind of get a feel for who um, is in our audience. First we have infection prevention professional. Next is sterile processing professional. Third is nurse manager or GI nurse. Fourth is laboratory professional. And fifth is if you are um, an other. <laughs> so we'll just give it one moment here to um, get as many votes in as possible. And for the results poll, we have 40% um, that answered infection prevention professional, 24% are serial processing professional, 13% are nurse manager or GI nurse, 2% or our laboratory professional, and 21% are other. Um, Alpha, I'll turn the floor over back to you. Thank you. The objective for today's webinar is to discuss the outbreaks in the news that we all have been seeing over a year or so and why facilities would want to perform surveillance of endoscopes. We will also go over the organism of concern regarding flexible endoscope surveillance or monitoring and, and what these organisms mean. We will also go over some basic test methods that are currently available for surveillance of flexible endoscopes and go over options regarding positive growth, 
of organisms and the thought process behind it. As you can see on the slide, USA Today published a great article in January of 2015 on how deadly bacteria medical scopes trigger infections. This article highlighted the outbreaks that occurred from 2012 to 2015 related to superbug CRE, otherwise known as carpopendum resistant enterobacteria. And the deadly effects it had on patients in several healthcare facilities here in the US. Investigators identified that almost 40% of patients infected with this superbug died. The reason for these infections were attributed to insufficient reprocessing of these endoscopes. As we, as we all have learned, that design itself makes it really difficult to clean and disinfect the scopes. However, more precaution and safety measures have been taken into consideration by the industry lead and regulatory agencies to respond to these outbreaks. The United States Senate Health Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee also reported on preventable tragedies, superbugs, and how ineffective monitoring or medical device safety failed patients in, 20, in January of 2016. Some of the highlights from these reports concerning outbreaks were that between 2012 spring of, and spring of 2015, closed channel duodenoscopes were linked to at least 25 different instances of antibiotic resistant infections that affected at least 250 patients worldwide. Antibiotic resistant infections relate to contaminated scopes even after cleaning and disinfection were not alerted in a timely manner. A lot of the discussion in the report was attributed to the challenging features and designs of the endoscope and how the construction of the endoscope hinders optimum manual cleaning. As a result of this report, US, US FDA has been working with medical device manufacturers of, of these type of endoscopes to have a valid validation plan in place, which, may ha which many have already accomplished and, ma and many are still in process. One way to help investigate these outbreaks is to do microbial surveillance on flexible endoscopes. Now the question is, what is microbial surveillance? Surveillance culturing of endoscopes include testing the sites that would be grossly contaminated during the use. These sites would include channels such as suction channel, air water channel, or elevator wire channel in the case of duodenoscopes, and the distal end of the scope. The current, lit the current literature recommends to test at least one channel, the instrument suction channel, as this is the channel that gets grossly contaminated during use and, and as well as the distal end. Testing these sites help identify any bacterial contamination that may have been present on the scope after reprocessing and help identify the next steps <coughs> that can be taken. There are some facilities that have successfully implemented the surveillance program to routinely culture these sites, mostly for duodenoscopes. Often, low concern organisms are recovered from the culturing despite reprocessing. Now, you may ask, why perform microbial surveillance? This is the number one question out there right now regarding these outbreaks, and is how do we fix this? Is there a way of minimizing the risk of getting these outbreaks, and how do we go about doing this? During the period of the outbreaks occur, occurring, CDC proposed a series of protocols that could be used, used to perform the surveillance of duodenoscopes. The protocols go in depth, step by step, about the benefits of performing the surveillance and how to perform these. These protocols are fully accessible on the FDA website. However, if you look at the overall reason to some of the basic reasons to why surveillance program would be beneficial to an institution is that it can act as a quality control marker to assess adequacy and completeness of reprocessing, which has been faulted to outbreaks related to CRA linked with the duodenoscopes. Reprocessing these scopes are very difficult and often have many steps. These steps could be from 20 to 30 steps for just the manual cleaning. Therefore, adherence to these reprocessing instructions is very critical. Microbiological surveillance would be an ideal way to monitor assurance of endoscope reprocessing efficacy. Each year, the Emergency Care Research Institute provides a list of top 10 health technology hazards as a free public service to inform healthcare facilities about important issues involving the issue use of medical devices and systems. As you can see from this slide, that for 2017, inadequate cleaning of complex reusable medical, sorry, complex reusable instrument can lead to infections is second on the list. ECRI has evaluated this concern and rated this problem in the top 10 list since 2011, which is concerning and alarming for all of us. However, if a 
if a monitoring and a training program is established at the healthcare facility regarding reprocessing, this might just help this problem. As you can see in this slide, the CLANR study led by Corey Offset from October 2008 through April 2009 at six U.S. sites indicated that institutions have adopted written GI endoscope reprocessing guidelines. However, there are clearly significant practices and wide variations in adherence within and between the institutions that were studied. As you can see from this slide that only 1% of all reprocessing instructions were followed as opposed to 99% that was not. As we know, reprocessing flexible endoscopes is a labor-intensive job, and the reprocessing steps do not include a, do include a lot of steps, in many cases 25 to 40 steps for just cleaning, can play a role in human factors. However, since, since that study, things in the healthcare facilities have been implemented to facilitate and consider human factors associated with reprocessing. One concern we hear about microbiological testing often is, what are we looking for? At this point, it's safe to say that most often the organism that cause infections should be considered an organism of concern. Also, the CDC has outlined in their protocols what key, what they consider are high concern organisms and have given recommendations to what kind of organisms should be in the watch list. Gram-negative organisms are most often associated with healthcare-associated infections and therefore should be considered for surveillance. Gram-negative bacteria include most of the bacteria normally found in gastrointestinal tract, which is where high-profile scopes come in contact with, including the duodenoscope. Some of the high-concern organisms listed in the CDC and other regulatory bodies have been narrowed down to the following list that you see on the slide right now. This does not mean that these are the only organisms that should be the focus of concern, but any organisms that could be potential risk should also be focus of concern. Particularly, any gram-negative organism should be a concern and should be investigated if cultured for positive. Plans to tackle high concern organisms should be the focus in healthcare facilities, especially where these scopes are being used. Steps of quarantine process or program should be outlined clearly and when these organisms are in concern. There is a lot of uncertainty right now regarding this process. However, until more is known, it is important for facilities to be aware of the potential risk of CRE transmission <coughs> and, they, and that they adhere strictly to the recommended reprocessing practices, particularly manual cleaning and drying. Any recoverable high concern organism should be placed in an alert action. As for low concern organisms, they are less often associated with disease and usually found in, in the environmental areas of the healthcare facility. Some of the examples of low concern organisms include gram positive organisms, mycococci, diphtherias, and, and bacillus species. The levels of low concern organisms on a duodenoscope can vary depending on the reprocessing, handling, and culturing practices in the facility. It is very important to implement aseptic techniques when culturing is in question as this will contribute to the final result that you receive when you're culturing. Facilities can monitor the levels of this bacteria within the first few months of the surveillance testing to come up with an expected baseline for those organisms to assess how to mitigate risk. It could also help you set action and alert level limits and, and help you further process with the investigation. There are a few regulatory agencies around the world that are recommending micro microbiological surveillance program where possible. There is still a lot of details that need to be ironed out with this program due to a lot of uncertainties associated with microbiological surveillance. One of the most discussed topics related to microbiological surveillance is how do we do this aseptically so we don't have false cultures or positives. Who would be doing the extractions and culturings? What is the quarantine process during the investigation? What do we do next if we get high concern organisms? How does the healthcare facility deal with, these, with this type of information? What is reportable and what is not? There seems to be a lot of confusion and understanding with microbiological surveillance. However, in the horizon, there's a lot of work being done to resolve these questions and and give some guidance and assurance of this program, which will be discussed later in this webinar. 
<coughs> the SGNA acknowledges that they are programs advised for regular microbiological surveillance, culturing of flexible endoscopes and mechanical processors in the processing guidelines of several international organizations. However, there are variances among the recommendation as well. The guidelines specify the awareness of routine surveillance microbiological culturing and how it's supported in the literature as an effective method of monitoring the effectiveness and quality of processing, reinforcing best practices, evaluating the effectiveness of corrective interventions, the detecting endoscopes requiring survey, service. Routine microbiological surveillance may also help to identify the source of contamination and rectify processing methods to prevent transmission of infection. Amy just discussed this topic in their fall meeting in October in their working group 84 S91 endoscope processing. During the discussion, it was suggested to incorporate the recommendation for the microbiological surveillance program in the pre-existing section in S91, but leaves it open to discussion of the assessment of for the surveillance program to the necessities of the healthcare facilities. However, there is still a lot of discussion regarding microbiological surveillance and will continue as more clarifications to this program is detailed by not only the regulatory bodies, but the industry that is dealing with this current problem. Iran recommends that multidisciplinary team that includes infection preventionists and endoscopists, endoscopy processing personnel, microbiologists, laboratory personnel, risk managers, and other involved personnel should evaluate the need to implement a program for regular microbiological surveillance culturing for flexible endoscopes and specifically duodenoscopes. They have suggested that the team should also evaluate methodology for culturing frequency, action, and alert levels, and how to report results. As for the FDA, they have provided a report for the industry re regarding supplemental measures to enhance the adenoscope reprocessing. FDA have encouraged the practice of microbiological surveillance program to have the healthcare facilities using culturing practices that best works for their organization. They have proposed alternate methods for sterilization for high-profile flexible endoscopes, either through ethylene oxide, liquid chemical sterilization, or repeating high-level disinfection. The FDA website gives a lot of helpful information regarding microbiological surveillance and guidelines, including the CDC interim guidance on culturing duodenoscopes and other variables related to reprocessing. As for CDC, uh, they have done a great job with outlining interim guidance on culturing duodenoscopes and are continuing their progress as they learn more. As, as the current version still has some clarification on culturing methods rec recommended, they have recommended that healthcare facilities start to perform microbial surveillance from ready to use duodenoscopes, scopes that have been fully processed, including the drying. They have recommended that a facility choosing to perform surveillance cultures can consider performing post reprocessing cultures periodically monthly or after every 60 procedures for each duodenoscope. Some facilities could choose to perform duodenoscope cultures weekly, for example, after, after procedures on Friday to allow cultures to incubate over the weekend. Alternately, facilities can choose to perform cultures after reprocessing following each use. Unfortunately, there isn't any magical number out there for what is the routine or what should be considered. Um, but the assessment for the routine is left up to the healthcare facilities needs and how they want to go about doing that. In the meantime, the CDC interim duodenos duodenoscope surveillance protocol has a great flowchart outlined that can help you identify steps to take if culture results in a positive for growth. Non-culture methods can be used to assess duodenoscope reprocessing, but they often lack consistent correlation to bacterial concentration. Thank you for listening to me. This completes my portion of the presentation. And now I will be handling, handing the webinar to the committee from Healthcare Industries to complete the rest of the webinar. Thank you, Alpa. Following up on what Alpa said, this is a recent study by Ofsted and Associates, and it discusses residual contamination in endoscopes. There were 17 scopes used in the study, 
and each scope was less than two and a half years old. The study found 16 out of the 17 scopes were still contaminated after manual cleaning. Contamination levels were higher for gastroscopes than colonoscopes. Boroscope exams of patient-ready scopes revealed residual fluid, as you can see in the first and the second photo, irregular surfaces and brown staining, as you can see in the third photo, and scratches and brown staining, as seen in the fourth photo. Among endoscopes tested for high-level disinfection, 71% failed to meet criteria for patient-ready endoscopes. 29% harbored viable bacteria. These findings indicate that current reprocessing methods were not sufficient. This is a study by Ofsted and Associates regarding how much damage and debris accumulate over time in endoscopes and the effect of more rigorous reprocessing methods. They conducted a longitudinal study over seven months. Over the course of this time, they compared standard manual reprocessing to more rigorous methods, which included manual cleaning followed by automated cleaning in AER. The results showed the endoscope contamination did accumulate over time. Also, manual cleaning was commonly ineffective. Rigorous reprocessing methods significantly reduced discoloration, and cleaning verification tests also exceeded their benchmarks with rigorous reprocessing. Now, ECRI is a patient safety-based organization, and it recommends what is best for the patient. The high-priority hazard report from ECRI addresses serious risk of CRE infections associated with duodenoscopes. It recommends culturing duodenoscopes as an important step to reduce CRE infections. We thus need to consider instituting routine CRE surveillance through culturing of duodenoscopes. Every duodenoscope needs to be cultured after reprocessing is complete and not released until negative results are achieved. If each scope cannot be cultured, the policy could include weekly testing. There are current publications supporting culturing to detect residual contamination. This is a very valuable peer-reviewed article, and it discusses a toolkit for monitoring endoscope reprocessing effectiveness. A bacterial monitoring toolkit enables sample collection from duodenoscope channels and facilitates sending it to a lab to get the bacteria enumerated and identified. This will enable facilities to determine the effectiveness of reprocessing and find out which bacteria are present in the scopes. Now I have a poll question. Becky, if you want to take over. Thank you. We will now ask the audience to participate in three poll questions. The first question is being launched now and asks, does your facility currently reprocess duodenoscopes used for ERCP procedures? Please select yes or no. Thank you for everyone's answer. We are now closing the poll. And it looks like we have 68% said yes and 32% responded no. Now I will ask the next poll question, which is, is your facility currently performing any type of culturing of your scope? Please select yes or no. Thank you everyone for your response. I just closed the poll. Looks like we have 37% answered yes and 63% answered no. For the third and final poll question of this series, um, I will ask of those performing culturing, is your facility performing the sampling and culturing in-house? Please select yes or no. Thank you for everyone who responded. I will now close the poll. Looks like we have 74% answered yes and 26% answered no. Kamudi, I'll now turn the floor back over to you. Thank you. This leads to a very important topic of microbial surveillance. Microbial surveillance is a supplemental measure of quality control in reprocessing. 
Although routine culturing of endoscopes is not part of the current US guidelines, recent outbreaks have led many facilities to consider regular bacterial surveillance. Last year, the CDC released three surveillance protocols. These may be used as a guide by healthcare facilities to assess the adequacy of their duodenoscope reprocessing. The interim duodenoscope surveillance protocol is regarding surveillance of bacterial contamination for scopes after reprocessing. The sampling protocol discusses the areas to be sampled and the methods for sampling. And the culture method discusses the options available for culturing, including the methods and the sampling media. In the CDC's guidance for culturing, the sites to be cultured include the instrument channel, the distal end, and the elevator channel. The frequency of culturing is recommended to be every 30 days or 60 cycles. Some facilities could even choose to perform cultures weekly, say after procedures on Friday, and allow cultures to intubate over the weekend. Or some facilities can choose to perform cultures after reprocessing following each use. Post-reprocessing cultures of duodenoscopes should be assessed for two types of microbial growth, high and low concern organisms. If successfully disinfected, culturing should not detect any high concern organisms. Typically, fewer than 10 colony forming units or CFU of low concern microbes do not require intervention. Any quantity of high concern organism that is one colony or greater warrants further remedial actions. In case of bacterial contamination, the remedial actions described in the CDC protocol include reprocessing any contaminated duodenoscope and reculturing. The culture should not be used again until it's free of high concern organisms or has an acceptable level of low concern organisms. Appropriate personnel should be notified if a reprocessing breach is identified and corrective actions should be taken. If the cultures are positive three or more times, consider evaluating the reprocessing technique and getting the scope evaluated by the manufacturer. Being certain that equipment is safe to be used on the next patient is a high stakes decision. There are options available to perform microbial surveillance. These options include traditional culturing in-house or using kits and gram-negative bacteria test kits like the NOW test. These are not ATP or cleaning verification tests, but are rather microbial surveillance tests. Now, not all hospital labs can do this type of testing. So Healthmark and Nelson Labs came together and created a mailback microbial surveillance service. It is one-stop shopping for sampling and culturing scopes. The service is meant for monitoring and reporting results from the sampled scopes. The kit is purchased upfront and the cost of shipping to Nelson Labs and performing cultures is included. The facility takes the sample and mails it directly to Nelson Labs. They are a certified lab and have a lot of experience in this field. And this is what makes the service very proficient. This mailback ser uh, service allows for independent and objective testing of the sample for the presence of any bacteria. If there are any present, these are further identified and quantified. The kit includes a protocol based on the CDC method, items needed to take the samples, including sterile brushes, pre-labeled shipper with cold packs, along with all the other necessary items. The timeline for the lab results are three days if no growth is observed, and seven to 10 days if there is any growth present. And there is more information on this link provided, which is healthmarkgi.com, and then click on the surveillance testing tab. Now for monitoring gram-negative bacteria in reprocessed scopes, a test called the NOW test is available. The way this works is there are enzymes that are specific to gram-negative bacteria. And these enzymes act with the reagent. And this causes fluorescence, which is read by the supplied fluorometer which then gives a reading. Amy ST91 also includes enzyme-based tests for testing of scopes. The NOW test is a simple and rapid test. It takes about 12 hours, which is still considerably shorter than traditional culturing. The test does not replace culturing, 
but offers a tool to do testing more frequently. The detection limit is 10 CFU for gram-negative bacteria. If there is a positive reading, reprocess the scope following manufacturer's guidelines before use. Dry the scope completely to be bone dry. Investigate if there are any repeat positives. And instructions for use and validation studies for the test are available online at healthmarkgi.com under surveillance testing. If a scope is tested positive for even one high concern organism, remove it from use. Review reprocessing practices to identify improvements in the process. Reprocess the scope again and rescreen for organisms. Quarantine the scope until results are obtained before placing back to use. And investigate each aspect of the protocol to assess efficacy of reprocessing. In case of low concern organisms, less than 10 CFU do not require any action. From 11 to 100 CFU, reprocessing should be reviewed to ensure adequacy of reprocessing. Sampling method should be reviewed. More than 100 CFU of bacteria may be indicative of inadequate reprocessing or damage to the endoscope. Review endoscope reprocessing as well as sampling and culturing protocols and methods. Remove the scope from use until the issue is resolved. Any duodenoscope found to be contaminated should not be returned to use until the contamination is removed from the scope. Culturing is resource intensive, but can be outsourced to an environmental or contract laboratory. Surveillance cultures take time, so assess your supply and clinical demand for duodenoscopes when considering microbial culturing. Put in place a surveillance program for your facility. Rapid tests for gram-negative bacteria are available, which provide a valuable resource for routine monitoring. With that, I thank you for attending this webinar. These are the references that we used for this talk. And here's the link if you want to get credit for today's presentation. You will receive this in an email to take the short quiz. With that, uh, I hand it over to Becky. Thank you, Alpha and Kamudi, for that fantastic presentation. We will now begin today's question and answer session. Please submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. We will try to get through as many questions as we have time for. The first question is about culturing, and it says, is culturing mandatory currently? Uh, good question. It is not mandatory in the U.S. currently. I know it is mandatory in some other countries. So I won't be surprised if it becomes mandatory here and we want to be prepared for that. Great. Thanks for elaborating on that, Kamudi. The next question is from an audience member who said, our lab looked at culturing and came back saying they couldn't do it. Do you know why they might have said that? I'll probably take that question. Um, there's probably a lack of information that, that must have been provided to the lab, and they don't know what culturing method to utilize for, for, this, um, for the surveillance. Uh, there, there has to be very clear instructions when, when you're giving it to a lab. Is it going to be a filtration? Is it a centrifugation test? Um, a lot of details need to be ironed out when you give um, these kind of tests to the lab. So, if you don't give enough information, they won't be able to do it, and, and they'll simply tell you that I, we won't be able to perform this, this test for you. Uh, and I'd like to follow up on that. Many hospital labs are certified by CLIA, which is Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments, and they can do their laboratory testing on humans, but endoscope samples are considered environmental samples. So uh, these labs might not be comfortable doing environmental samples. Great, thank you both for helping to explain that. I think it's helpful to understand. Our third question is, do you have some kind of test data that shows the now? Test, do the, does the test work as well as you say? <laughs> so uh, the validation studies for the now test were done by two separate uh, independent labs. And these studies are available online actually at healthmarkgi.com under the microbial surveillance tab. 
Thanks, Moody. I think that's helpful to point out. Mm -hmm. uh, another audience wants to is wondering if you can explain why it takes up to eight days to get a result for the culturing service. So I, I can take this question. Um, cultures take time to grow, and usually they take up to 72 hours to grow. So that's three days once they're once they're grown. Um, to identify if they are high concern or low concern organisms, they have to go through IDs testing, and that takes that takes additional days for for a laboratory to find out what kind of organism that that is. So that's where th these accumulative days come from. And it's, Thanks, it's it's based on. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, absolutely. Go ahead. I was just going to say it's it's based on a, this would be like the worst case, um, but usually we, we laboratory is able to get you earlier than eight days, but usually eight days is if there's no growth, of course it's three days. Because but um, if there is growth, then it starts to add up in days. That is a great point. Thank you. The next question is, are any of the scopes being treated with antimicrobial coating, such as silver, for example? Not that I am aware of. Um, Kamudi, are you aware of that? Um, I, I am not aware of that either. OK. Thank you. It's a good point, um, though. Yeah. <laughs> really. Can the specimen for culturing be collected by one person? Uh, it would be helpful to have two pers people uh, sampling. So one can be uh, one can hold the scope, and the other person can actually do the sampling. So one person can be a septic, uh, and the second person can actually take the sample. And it would also help. Um, Reduce cross contamination when you are sampling. It's it's very easy to to um, I have done it by myself before, and it it is it it does uh, take a lot of uh, your your abilities to work aseptically. But with two people, it's simpler and uh, it's more aseptic, like Kamudi just said. Great, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Uh, another question from the audience reads. Do you recommend culturing gastroscopes and colonoscopes? I might be saying that wrong. In addition to duodenoscopes? Uh, I know the current um, guidelines are for duodenoscopes. Uh, so right now, the duodenoscopes are under the cross wires. But, uh, so that would be a facility's decision to, to uh, culture other kinds of scopes. Great. Thank you for clarifying that question. Have you tested the performance of antimicrobial treated scopes? Are there any approved on the market for scope applications? Again, I'm not aware of it. I'm, I'm not aware of that either. Great. Uh, let's ask another question from our audience. How much does one environmental culture cost through Nelson Labs, and how much is the now test? Uh, you know, we'll be able to send you the pricing information in an email as a follow-up to this. Perfect. We'll get that sent out to all the viewers after the webinar. Okay. Another audience member wants to know, how do you report back the to the facility with the results? Are there any security measures in place? So the results there is are kept an email. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Kumudi. So the results are kept confidential. Uh, Nelson Labs directly sends it to an email portal of the, which is uh, which belongs to the hospital or the facility whose samples are being sent. Do you want to follow up, Alpha? And with the email, the final report is also sent to to them as well. That's helpful to know. Thank you, Bill. The next question is, what are techniques for detecting non-bacteria contamination, um, specifically infectious proteins? Uh, great question. There are many tests, there are many rapid tests available uh, to identify protein, hemoglobin, or even carbohydrates from endoscope lumen. So there are swab-based tests and flush-based tests. 
So swab-based tests include a long, uh, a long swab that runs through the channel. The very sensitive tests, so uh, protein tests can be as sensitive to one microgram. Hemoglobin tests can be sens sensitive to 0.1 microgram. So very sensitive swab-based tests. And there are flush-based tests available too. So flush water through the lumen, collect the water, and there are dipsticks available, uh, uh, which will detect hemoglobin, carbohydrates, and protein on the dipsticks. Does that answer hey, your thank you for question? Thank you for clarifying that one. So I know we've gone through a good amount of questions. I think we'll ask a few more before we sign off, if that sounds good. So the next question is, if you were culturing other types of scopes, what kinds of organisms would you look for? It would probably be the same type of organism. Any high concern organisms that come from any scope is alarming and concerning. So if it's a high concern organism, it, the, um, the, the, there is some quarantine that you would have to assess and, and worry about as well. There, there isn't one type of organism that you're looking for when you do surveillance and, and culturing. It's, it's, it's basically a group, and, and that's the group that we call the high concern organisms. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Another audience member would like to know if it matters whether you collect a sample from a scope right after reprocessing or if the scope has been in storage. It could come, um, you can do surveillance at any point in processing. Of course, um, CDC does recommend that you do it after post reprocessing, but it, it could be right after reprocessing or it could be when it's bone dry. But you, right before, usually it's, it's right before when you're, after it's dry, and before it will be used, that's when you want to do processing to make sure that all the aspects of the reprocessing has been assessed. Great. Thank you so much for shedding a little more light on that. It looks like we have time for one more question. And the final question reads, is culturing required by any CDC guidelines and is surveillance with ATP luminometer adequate? The CDC recommends doing culturing, it's a recommendation, and ATP is not a microbial surveillance test, uh, so uh, microbial surveillance, when you want to actually monitor bacteria, doing actual culturing or specific enzymatic tests are, are efficient. Great. Well, we had a lot of great questions. I would like to thank everybody for submitting them. That is all the time we have for today. I want to thank Alpha and Kamudi for their excellent presentation and to our audience for participating today. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we look forward to having you join us for a future webinar. Thank you.